Welcome back to everyone. This is The Elevated Entrepreneur. I'm your host, as always, Raylan Davis. And with me, I have an outstanding guest. His name is Mike Grice. I've been seeing him online for a hot minute. Sales blending with brand strategy. Uh, if you're someone that feels like you're not making as much as you could, then most importantly, you feel lost at times. I think we all do, especially if you're an online coach, etc. This is going to be the podcast for you. Uh, as, as always, man, I'm excited to, to meet with you, excited to chat with you. Welcome to the podcast, sir. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you. It's, uh, it's fun. I love, I mean, I love just chatting about this stuff, right? Like, um, sales and branding. Yeah, that, that's a lot of what I do. I, I've been in sales for a long time in a lot of different capacities. One of my first gigs ever was a personal trainer. Um, mm. so you're, you're, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm selling training sessions and stuff like that. Gym memberships that, that was when I was going through school, um, and then got into the technology space. So selling software and, and, you know, just kind of getting introduced to product, uh, management, product marketing, certainly branding, and all of this ties really, really well. And in, in my opinion, into your overall sales strategy, right? There's, um, there's a lot that goes into sales that isn't just marketing, uh, and, and isn't just you getting on a phone call and trying to pitch somebody. There's a lot more to it that involves brand. Your own personal brand is a big piece of that i think it's key to any successful sales strategy so uh yeah anyways i know we'll get into some more of this but definitely happy to be here well listen man i, I think the reason why and i told you this earlier too is the reason why i wanted you on the podcast is because i had this realization when i met um who now is our creative director of our agency tim um he's a branding guy and he, he, him and i started working together because he was a client of mine and mm -hmm. once i started working with him i started realizing that all problems are branding problems Right. And I realized how much easier life gets when you have a good brand. And what's funny is he was a client and then I ended up hiring him as the creative director of the agency because he helped me out. So like he helped me out more, probably more than I helped him like as, as my client. And so when I saw that I had this realization maybe, you know, a year or so ago, and then I saw you and you were blending branding with sales. And I, you know, I realized like, oh man, like that is, that is the take. So I guess let's start with this. So obviously you were doing tech sales, you have a background in gym sales, which is funny because that's how I got my start in sales as well. Um, mm -hmm. But what started you getting interested in branding together and maybe even give us a definition of what branding is? Because I really don't think a lot of people know what branding actually means. So maybe start with like, again, what got you interested in branding in general as a sales guy? Because most sales guys were Neanderthals and we're just like, I'm just going to call you. Um, so talk to, talk to me about that. Yeah. Most of us don't like marketing, right? We, we see there's a big disconnect between stuff that they're pitching and what we think we can actually sell. Um, so yeah, and I was always working again in the technology space and actually Tim and I connected a, a little while back, uh, around, you know, kind of how we, there's some parallels there in our strategies and, and, uh, Tim's got a lot of good stuff. So I, I definitely see how you would, would get pushed to work with a guy like that. Um, but really, when I when I was selling, uh, it just to me, so many people were focusing on the pitch and the product, right? Like, here's all the amazing things we do. Uh, this is why it's different. This is why it's better. And nine times out of ten, that kind of got people into a defensive response, or they immediately would say, "I don't know if I really need this." because we're just listing a bunch of product features and we're not necessarily linking it appropriately to what they want to sell for, or maybe they don't even know what they want to sell for yet. So the branding side of it is helping people to understand a little bit more about what you're about, what your business is about, what type of transformation you're going to help people achieve. And so before they ever even reach out to you, before you even have a conversation with them, they understand on some level, right, what the benefit is. And so, you know, your, your brand helps attract people to you and branding and marketing. Yeah, there's lots of parallels there for sure. Um, but marketing is, is much more, I think, product focused or, or, you know, service focused. You're talking a little bit more about the actual tangible item that they would be purchasing. Uh, whereas branding is just a, a combination of everything, the experience, your reputation, right? Um, why people should care about you, why they should view you as an authority figure. All this goes into a strong personal brand and personal brand is kind of where I focus more so than, um, you know, if, if you're a business or an agency and what type of brand you want, that that's similar, but personal branding, in my opinion, regardless of whether you're an entrepreneur or you're part of a business, I think there's a lot of benefits for you to elevate yourself amongst your peers 
And again, all of this goes into the sales side of it because when you get into a conversation with someone, now there's very little about them challenging your opinion or, or your strategy or what you're actually recommending because they already view you as an established authority in that space, right? So now, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. This guy understands the market, the challenges, the, the ideal customer, all this kind of stuff. I don't need to challenge and get so defensive. I actually want to learn. I'm curious to learn from this individual about how they can help me. And so knocking down those barriers ahead of time, in my opinion, uh, really helps your sales strategy ex get expedited and, and get you more clients and the right clients a lot faster. So like for you, I feel like what you're saying is like with, with great clarity, and I think also too on, on, on the business owner side, the more clear you are about why am I authority in this space, like what does actually make me different? Like right. what do I what do I even am I fucking saying? Because I think most people actually don't know. They just we just regurgitate what other coaches say or entrepreneurs say. And and so with that clarity then gets to the point where when you do have leads get to the sales call, the sale then becomes easier because like uh, Dean Jackson and Joe Polish say, they're pre-motivated and pre-interested, right? Like the call then doesn't become, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it feels like, you know, with really good branding, how it helps you with your sales is that with good branding, you don't have to sell anymore. It's just verifying they're going to be a good fit. And that's what the sales call becomes. Is that kind of what you're saying? 100%. And so you, you will actually see a lot of times where your volume of, inbound interest, right? So whether you want to call it a lead or, or just someone that's reaching out to you proactively, uh, your volume of leads might actually decline. But your ability to convert this individual into a client will actually increase because you're, you're kind of filtering out all of the people that are just going to kick tires, uh, that really are never going to work with you in the first place. And there's a number of reasons why they wouldn't. Uh, and you mentioned clarity. It's a big, big component to it, right? If you're unclear about what your offer is and how you can help people, then how can you expect them to be clear on how you can, uh, and then why they should work with you, right? So having that strong brand answers a lot of those questions ahead of time. So then when people come into that conversation, they're prepared. They're prepared to talk about how you can help them uh, tackle X, Y, and Z. How, you know, what do you, what do I need to do to be ready to work together? They're, they're much more um, further down the line towards making a buying decision than if they're just, you know, oh, they, they, they saw your website somewhere and they wanted to reach out and have a conversation. Um, guys like us, we don't really have time for that. Uh, you know, you probably feel the same way, but I just don't have the time anymore to jump on 10 sales calls in a week that go nowhere. And if you're unclear on your message and if you're unclear on your value statement and who the hell should, should be interested, then you can expect there to be a lot of conversations that, that end up producing nothing and then you're chasing them. And, and you know, I'm not a fan of, of outbound uh, outreach really either. So I think, again, what, what you really do want to do with your brand is just be crystal clear on who you can help. Um, how you are uniquely positioned to help them. And that could be your experience, your knowledge, skill set, whatever. And then ultimately what they're going to gain from it. And if you're not clear on that, then don't expect them to be clear on why they should work with you. Yeah, I, I would even say, argue that like, if you're not clear on it, they're probably like 10x less clear than even you are. Yeah. And it's been something, and, and I think one of the things that's fascinating about branding in itself is that it's not like you're never done working on it. Like I have a meeting with my team every single day um, with obviously like one-on-ones and different various things. But most of what we're talking about is like, are we following through on like our promise? Uh, and even for example, it just not even from a business perspective, but from a uh, branding perspective, there's a, there, there has been clients that we have not elected to continue working with because their message was against ours. Mm. So we were, especially with our agency, we were helping, for example, like we were helping this individual that constantly was promoting this victim mindset to like, to their, to his audience. And it was like, okay, well elevated, the brand is about removing excuses and obstacles, but yet we're working and giving more awareness to this company that is promoting victim mindset. Like everything mm -hmm. is not your fault. It's the world's fault. And, and so, but yeah. it's, what's interesting is though, even from branding is not just, I think about clarity of your message and authority. It also goes into how you run your culture of like your own company, what you're trying to build. And maybe that's a little bit too far ahead for, for some, but I think starting here is a really good place. But also uh, the other question I want to ask you, Mike was like, 
uh, go back to like the beginning. Like why, why branding? What got you into even wanting to be online? Because for me, when I first started out, like I heard from a friend that you could make money online. And I was like interested. What's funny is I found this video, Mike, uh, the other day. It was kind of funny. Um, I went back on my old, my own company. I used to do, um, now we do Tough Love Tuesdays. But back then I did Motivational Mondays. And right. this was just for my company for my cl- and for my uh, some of my clients, but also a lot of my uh, employees. But I would just film like a 10-minute talk about something I've read or whatever. And it was just motivational, like a story. And I did this every single week. And so it was funny because it's popped up on my Facebook because I was like, it started well before I got online. I was just doing it because I wanted to help. Um, and then fast forward to, you know, a friend of mine started, you know, uh, online coaching and said like, hey, people suck at sales. Like, come online and teach people how to do it. And then that's how I got my start. But for you, like, why did you get online and start coaching? Yeah, I love that. I love that question. And so, um, you know, again, I, I was I was in a variety of different sales roles, always customer facing roles, um, technology, selling technology, consulting on some of these big transformational projects, more so like I know that's kind of a broad statement, but sales, marketing technology, even like, you know, financial automation, stuff like that. Um, and we were having all of these really, really interesting conversations about about transformations and, and all of, you know, how this is going to propel your brand forward and, and, and help you differentiate in your own market and, and all these great buzzwords that people throw around in the boardrooms. And it kind of hit me one day as, you know, I don't think this stuff is digestible in a, in a very, you know, for the average person. And if, if they, if I was to, you know, just bring over a friend and have them sit in some of these meetings, they would be like, I don't know what the hell you guys are talking about. It sounds really, really cool, but I don't know what that means. Um, and so I started to have more of these one-off conversations, even just with some of my peers that I worked with, and I would begin to kind of coach them on on what they should think about when they're going into these meetings with their clients, you know, how they can put themselves in a better light, how they can become more of a unique um, advisor. And, and again, that's going to differentiate them from the competition, all these cool things. And then I thought, you know, one day, um, wouldn't it be interesting if I just started posting about this and seeing if anybody actually cares, seeing if, you know, entrepreneurs care coaches care or even anybody who's sitting on instagram and and likes to you know eat up all that motivational content that they, we see out there and like are people going to care about this so i started posting uh didn't show my face it was very much carousels and you know one say, yeah. one pagers and stuff like that right and then why did I didn't you not show really... your face was there a reason for that uh, just, I think I, I was, I wasn't sure if anybody would, would even care about it. And so before I got out there and threw myself in, uh, I, I just thought, let me test the waters a little bit, which I think, I think was limiting. I was limiting belief at the time. And, and, you know, going through that, I realized now that it probably hampered my growth a little bit. And that's why I tell my clients, like, look, if you're going to do it, just do it. Like, don't wait. But, um, ultimately I started seeing other creators who, who were, you know, had a lot more followers and they were already not influencer status, but they were just already established and they started reaching out and saying, Hey man, this is good stuff. Like I don't, I haven't seen this kind of stuff before. Hmm. And the message was unique and that uniqueness and me just being myself and sharing my own thoughts. Um, I think it resonated with people because like, like we've talked about, there's just so much shit online that's regurgitated and no one wants to see that anymore. I think they, they appreciate a, a refreshing new perspective uh, so that's how I got into it. I know it's a long winded answer, but it's, it's just like you said, it's, it's constantly evolving. Your brand is never established fully. It's always changing and, and you're just trying to get better every day. So then what, what are you doing now for clients and who do you normally work with? So typically it's, it's either coaches who are, um, not fully established. So maybe they're, they're sitting there and, and they, and they know that they're really good at a certain, you know, field whether it's personal training, fitness coaching, you know, any kind of wellness instructors or, or just business coaches as well, right? Um, maybe they think there's a little bit of a niche they can take advantage of. And so that's kind of where they've reached out to me and I'm, I'm seeing that this is evolving now into people who, who know what they want to do, but they have no idea how to get started in terms of their sales and their go-to-market and their marketing and branding, all that fun stuff. Um, and also now it's it's taken another bit of a, of a turn into business owners. So established business owners who are recognizing that their online brand is shit, meaning their own personal brand doesn't exist. And so they're, they're 
I think understanding the benefits now, even though that they're already within a business and their business is successful, but them as the creative owner behind it, I mean, no one knows who they are and no one really definitely don't, they don't view them as an authority because they're just hiding behind the business. And one of the points you mentioned, right, in terms of like cultural and, and all the different values that, that link you and your brand to others, if you know as, as a business leader what those values are, it helps you make informed decisions in every other area of your business, like like hiring. You don't want to hire people that are just going to be outside of that, you know, that value message and that strategy. So um, my clients would, it's kind of a broad category, but certainly early stage coaches, early stage entrepreneurs, and even business owners that just, like I said, don't really have any grasp on what their brand is. Well, I think one of the things that hopefully people, and there's something too that you can tell some of the, your business owners, but like there's a huge benefit of having a personal brand. If they're like, if they're like, you know, I'm already making a whole bunch of money. What do I need a personal brand for? It's like, well, do you want to hire more quality people? Because like when you have a solid personal brand, the goal is to have them see your personal brand and go, man, I couldn't, you know, I would love to work with her or I would love to work with yeah. him. Like, I love that methodology. I love that line of thinking. Or like I was the, um, looking at like, this was before I started my online business, but there's a company called Design Pickle and uh, here in Arizona and they were like revolutionizing like the design, uh, graphic design model. Because before it was like a whole, you had to hire like a whole ass person spend a whole bunch of money uh, to have a graphic designer. But now they're doing, they basically pulled in a bunch of these freelancers and now it's like super cheap. I think it's like starting package is 200, maybe $300 a month um, for a company to get like almost unlimited graphic design work. Yeah. And, and so anyway, I listened to the, the, the CEO though on a podcast and I was like, man, that is an awesome, like I would love to work with this company. And so I reached out and like, I tried to get a job there. This was like a couple years ago. But still, like, how? Did, so my point is, how did I find out about the company? How what made me get excited about the company? What was the CEO on a podcast sharing his story about how he came up with Design Pickle? About you know, which by the way, it was just a funny name he came up. Like you know, it's just all these marketing tactics, how he did it, how he was broke. Like the story is what sold me as someone that wanted to be a candidate for them and, and working with them. Now, now you fast forward. I have probably talked about Design Pickle countless fucking times and i've told tons of companies about them all because of a really cool story the ceo had yeah. and so i think you know for business owners in general the personal brand you know uh, direction is something especially and what's funny is i talk to a lot of older um coaches consultants that are like in their 50s and you'd be surprised that maybe you wouldn't but how many people are like i don't need to do a personal brand and it's like no it's so they funny because i'm like you've made like there's somebody i talked to just uh last week about joining the agency and he's like i don't think i need that like that won't work for my company and i go well how do you make money now well, he's like oh ray and we did seven figures last year all from referral da, da, da. and i go well don't you see how like why did they refer you though oh because of me and because of what they know about me da, 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 da. and i go okay but if way more people knew about you wouldn't you like it's kind of a referral right like i think of how many people online that i've you know said oh my god you need branding work okay go check this person out check tim out check this person out check mike out yeah. like like literally just today one of my people that's in our, our coaches academy was like hey i have this really cool business idea that i'm gonna do this i'm not gonna spill it but he needed so he needed to be connected to somebody that does automation literally right on the call i created a chat with those two and said hey this is the business idea go run with it like that's a referral but how does that happen well because i know that guy from online Right. Like, how do you not see? But it's so funny because it's like when you have that limiting belief or when you when you are so close minded, I think you miss out on all the possibilities. So it's just it's fascinating to me how many people are like, I don't need a personal brand. It's like you don't need one. But what would it do for you if you had one? Oh, man. I, it, so it's you're right. So many people and I don't want to say that it's it's just to some of the older generations. Right. But if, if you are not. Up you to won't, speed but I will. on on what's <laughs> happening online. If you don't see the growth of some of these companies, because people are really, really getting behind what this owner, what this creator is is presenting and what they're selling and pitching, all these different things, it's such a accelerated way to create awareness for your business. What used to take, 
marketing campaign after marketing campaign, events, all this different shit to create awareness for your business. Now it can happen overnight with, like you said, a really, really strong story about the company coming from the owner. And when the people are able to do this, it draws people to them naturally and creating that attraction is the best form of outreach you can do because you're qualifying people, you're creating excitement, curiosity, all these things that you're, you're creating within that individual is going to make them that much more likely to buy from you in the future. So again, the brand, I, I would challenge any business owner who isn't taking advantage of their own personal brand to ask themselves, why not? Right. What's the worst that could happen? People are going to hate you. Well, maybe, but they probably would have hated you some way or another, regardless. Right. They're going to find a way to dislike you. But the people that do like you are going to be head over heels for it. And they're going to go and want to work with you. And it also creates all these different opportunities for partnerships. Like you just mentioned. Now you're introducing, you're bringing in, in referrals, right? You're opening up new doors and new opportunities because people are aware what the hell you do. And I, I just, I love that because there's so many secondary benefits that people just don't see behind the brand side of it until they finally say, okay, maybe I should share my story. Maybe I should talk about this more and more. Um, and then that, you know, them explaining their vision and everything behind the business, I think it really opens up the door to new opportunities. You know, one of the things I think that to help me with like the elevated brand was talking to more people. Like I didn't have it flushed out because I, I knew conceptually that I wanted to do something different and have, you know, a community, I hate the word community, a mastermind that you talked a little bit about coaching. And then obviously like we, we give information, but the more so what am I selling? I'm selling self mastery. I'm selling accountability. Like everyone else sells that information, but the truth is like everyone, you can find the information anywhere. Like it's not just right. read more books. You'll find it. Okay. Um, but one of the things that I realized though, when I, the thing that helped me the most was at the time we had clubhouse and I, every day was talking about what I was doing. And so that helped me flush out the branding. And I think another piece of advice I would give to people, it's kind of similar to what you're doing right now on this podcast is go do podcasts like, yeah. or even have your own because talking about what you do, it helps like flush it out. And then when you start to w help me anyway, and I don't know uh, if you would give the same advice to someone that maybe doesn't understand their brand yet is what I did was the more I talked, I started seeing through lines. Oh, I say this a lot. Oh, I say this a lot. And then I started underlying and like, oh, there it is in a very simplistic way, which then how we came up with our purpose, right? Which is to help people realize they deserve more through removing excuses and obstacles. How did that mm -hmm. come about? It's because all I talked about was how I was tired of hearing people fucking complain about their lives and not doing anything about it. <laughs> and how I was tired of like giving people, because I'll tell you the truth. When I was doing sales coaching, I was just doing sales coaching, only teaching sales. And the biggest mistake I was making was that people would, let's say you and I were working together. I would teach you the strategy, whatever. And it was only a two month program. You'd make a bunch of money, you know, at the end of it. But then I would follow up with you in two months and you were back to making no money. Yeah. So what went wrong? Either I suck as a coach, which, is per which like I was willing to say that that's perfectly possible, or I didn't address the actual issue, which was your behavior and how you look at yourself and how you view the world. So it became this thing of, no, what Elevated actually is, is a way for people to stay what we call in, in context. Long, all that to be said, do you feel like, what would you give, what would your recommendation be to someone that's like starting out as a coach? They're looking out online and seeing all these other coaches. They're like, I don't know how the fuck I'm different. What would be your advice and some actions they could take to actually start to figure out how, how are they different? Maybe find their purpose. Maybe figure out how they can stand out online because to your point, there's a shit ton of us that are online. By the way, I should have warned you before. I swear a lot in this podcast. <laughs> hey, no, I'm, trust me. I'm good. I'm, I'm, it makes me more comfortable to swear also. So that, that's good. Um, if, you watch my, if you watch any of my content, you should know I swear a lot. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, that makes a good podcast, like, right? It shows the passion behind it. And I think if, if – so if you are just starting out or you, you're looking for something that you can kind of latch on to, like you said, podcast is awesome. But uh, to me, it's just content. Like where else do you have a zero barrier to entry platform, right? Anybody can create an Instagram account, Facebook, whatever the hell you want to use. Go for it. Um, and just start posting content, talking about shit, posting stories, your own, you know, it, unique knowledge that you want to share, educate people, start talking about it. And what you'll find is, is that over time, 
it's not even about the engagement because a lot of people that are highly engaged, as you know, they, they're just kind of supporting, but they're not really interested in what you're selling. Yeah. They're so also, one of the things on. I realized though, they're really important though, still like those people are key to growing. Cause there's people that have been following me for three years, never bought a single thing for me, but they're like the biggest supporters and like talk about me all the time. Like, and that, so it's like that level of support is that's motivating too. And, and that kind of re reassures you. But I'd say as you go through, you really understand, okay, what am I motivated to talk about, right? Like, what do I, what excites me to talk about? If I ask you a question and you just immediately, like, you can't wait to respond, like, those are things that excite you and they motivate you. And, and me talking about, like, my clients and, and how so many of the missteps on the brand side of it. The, I, I, I love that shit. I, it motivates me because I know what they can achieve if they actually really invest the time to take – full advantage of their own personal brand and you know what it's super fucking easy it doesn't have to be difficult it, it's not complex you know you're not spending two years having to create this mass it's no it's already there your own unique thought process your own perspective i'm sure you share it with your friends and family right just now go out online and start sharing it with other people and see what they think too and over time it'll it'll turn into something one day it'll hit you in the face and say that's what's going to become my first program my first offer I think that's what people want, right? So that would be my advice uh, is just, just go out there and start posting shit, start talking to people, um, make connections online and keep going. I think that's part of the problem is that like we think that we have to have it figured out before we kind of like start online where it's like to your point, if you just consistently showed up as yourself, then over time, I think people like that journey. Like I, there's someone I was talking to recently and um and, and I said, just start posting online. Like, what are you doing? And she was like, well, I want to make, I want to get my offer down before I start to, and I go, well, look, some people like want to see the whole journey. Like some of my favorite people that still follow me will go, man, I remember when you came out with this, when you first started and now you're this, like, that's so cool. Like people like seeing the journey and also people don't do it enough, but like, I also get things wrong online and I like making content about how I fuck things up. Like Mike, I literally... Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, maybe longer. In my defense, like it takes sometimes that like we make stuff and then sometimes we put it out like a month later. But I made a I made a post recently about how like Facebook social audio is gonna change the world. Like how it's gonna change the game for for entrepreneurs. Mike, I don't know if you got the notification, but they're closing social audio. <laughs> I was wrong as shit. Like I was super wrong. But that's part of the thing. And now I get the cool part is now I get to make a piece of content, which I just said on this podcast is probably gonna turn a piece of content, how I got it wrong. And that becomes a thing. Like, and so I think when people are afraid, if people are afraid to make the mistake, but by not making the mistake, they don't move. And because they don't move, they're, they don't do anything. It's just kind yeah. of those things. Okay, so I wanted to go back to ask you this. Why did you pick Instagram? Why was that your platform? Because I mean, I mean, there's a ton to choose from. Um, and I think for me, it makes sense that the progression is usually like, get on one platform, figure that out. And then, you know, you could stem from there. What I did is I started with Instagram and then I went from Instagram to everywhere. <laughs> like I was like, yeah. I'm gonna, like now I'm like I create for everything. But for you, why did you pick Instagram versus like again Facebook or LinkedIn? I mean, especially with your background, I feel like LinkedIn would have been huge for you. Why did you pick Instagram? So I, I mean, I was already on Instagram, uh, so that's just the easiest answer, I guess. But really, it, it to me was I, I just I understood the platform the best at the time, um, and so you know I I wouldn't say I'm a techie guy. But I like technology and I like taking advantage of like new features, you know, and I just felt like Instagram to me offered me the best opportunity to showcase my skill set in a relatable way. Because it's not just video content, it's not just audio, it's everything, right? There's a way it's, it's you, you can share your knowledge in you know, carousel posts, which kind of, you know, I, I'm, I'm used to the guy that goes, I go into a boardroom and present a slideshow, you know, a Google mm -hmm. slide. That's kind of what I did. Right. So for me to transition to um, Instagram, it was, it was an easier transition to make. And I would say I already knew a few people that were doing it through Instagram. So I had a level of comfort there as well. But yeah, it, to me, it was just, I was most comfortable with that platform. I thought it had, uh, I could scale the fastest on it and the, you know, the diversity of the content and how you can post was something that I just thought would be good and, and would be valuable. But why not LinkedIn for you? I feel like you would crush on LinkedIn. I mean, I am on LinkedIn and it, it's, I post a lot of sales stuff. Um, I, I find 
LinkedIn and it's changing, but there is more of a professional identity that that people choose when they go on LinkedIn. Now, again, this is changing. Um, whereas Instagram was kind of like, who gives a shit? Post whatever you want, right? I don't really care. Yeah, yeah. Um, whereas LinkedIn, you could be seen as a little bit of no. I mean, disruptor is a good thing in my opinion, but I didn't know how it would resonate. Uh, with it as well as Instagram would. So LinkedIn is, is definitely thing, kind of phase two. Yeah. The only thing that I would say that's like a little bit different is that like if you took your same carousel that you had on Instagram, but then and you post it on LinkedIn, it would do okay. But what makes it better is if you write a good story yeah. leading up to it of like how you came to that. Because the I think what it, what it is on LinkedIn is that like the most of how they figure out how to ca- characterize, characterize stuff is not the hashtags, but it's actually the words used in the actual caption itself. And so what I found that does really well is a single p- picture and then a huge story. Yeah. Like I'll get way more engagement, whatever, but also it's like a different caliber of person. So like also to me, my avatars are different from LinkedIn to your point almost uh, as LinkedIn and, 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 and Instagram. So my agency is more LinkedIn and then the yeah. Academy is more Instagram. So that's why I don't talk as much about like what we do on the agency. Like most people on Instagram have no idea what you even have in an agency, but it's because on LinkedIn, that's where majority of my people come from is because they're someone that like probably is like a seven figure, six figure, you know, consultant and they just want to offshore or offload their, their marketing. So my content. So what's funny is you can repurpose. I think this is, I think Gary Veer t- talks about this actually the best, but what people get wrong is they repurpose. So what some people will tell you is Mike, take your Instagram content and just throw it over on, on LinkedIn. The smarter thing to do if you have the time is do repurpose it to LinkedIn, but add a longer caption. Show up the way people want to sh- like be seen on LinkedIn, which is for some reason it's a written word. And then I remember somebody, I think it was my buddy Sebian, who's like a big LinkedIn guy, told me this and it makes perfect sense. Okay, who's on LinkedIn? Most of them are going to be the nine to fivers. Well, they yeah. can't listen to video as much on LinkedIn because they might be at work, right? So what's going to do better? Well, it's going to, the written word's going to do better on LinkedIn. Anyway. Um, I think you should be, my point is, I think you should be on LinkedIn. I'm a, like, I'm a huge proponent on LinkedIn. I've made more money in the last year from LinkedIn than any other platform, which is, hel- I, if you would have told me that a year ago, I would have told you you're full of shit. <laughs> well, the market there is already, like you kind of said, right? It's, it's already qualified. Um, mm-hmm. and so that, that's certainly part of the strategy ongoing, right? Because these people, if, if I'm a, um, you know, if I have like a, a, a blue collar job, Am I going to have a LinkedIn profile? Maybe, maybe now, but probably not five years ago because I didn't really see the value in it. But LinkedIn's changing now where it is becoming more of, of I think, an all-inclusive social platform. It's not just the professional nine-to-fivers like you kind of said. Um, so I, I do think there is a lot of value there. And, and what you'll get and what I've heard, again, you kind of just confirmed it, is um, people will come to you and they're already prepared to buy Whereas Instagram, it's a longer journey to nurture that individual and, and to kind of, but you, you also can, um, you know, be a little bit more of, of your own unique self on Instagram versus LinkedIn. So there's benefits to both, uh, you know, but I, I think overall being diversified in, in whatever platforms you're using, that should be kind of your end goal. Start with one if it's more comfortable, but obviously you want to grow and scale across the board. Yeah, because that's why for me, I'm platform agnostic. I don't think yeah. there's only one platform that I'm long on, and that's YouTube. Like, I'm creating all my content now is for YouTube specifically, because I think in the long run, like, that's what I care mostly about. Um, yeah. But for to your point, though, LinkedIn is interesting because um, if, like, I have an outbound strategy I use on LinkedIn that's worked like, really well for me. And it's very much, it's a, it's a, it's a more classy pitch dm right yeah. there's a story behind it i make fun of myself in it and it does well um if i were to use that same strategy on instagram no not a single person would buy for me but that strategy has brought me like has that strategy alone on linkedin probably i would if i had to put a number to it would be like probably like 110 thousand this year from linkedin and it's all people that are like yeah, like again, like uh, when I first got to LinkedIn, this is the, I used to bring the same strategy I used to do on Instagram to LinkedIn, which is a long term relationship build through the DMs, right? Yeah. And what made me change everything was that a guy go, dude, are you just going to fucking pitch me already? Like, what do you want? And I was like, oh shit. And I go, well, this is what I do. And he's like, all right, well, let's get on a call. God. <laughs> and I was like, oh, like these people are busy. 
Like they have shit they to time. do. They don't have time for all that fluff and that bullshit, right? Which I, I can respect. And it's like you said, yeah. in Instagram, people don't want you to pitch them right away. LinkedIn is a bit different. They don't have time to read through all your personal anecdotal bullshit. They want to get to it. Yeah. And that versus on Instagram, when I say you got to buy someone dinner first, uh, you got to yeah. know their first kids' names, you got to do all that. And then you can, you know, warrant the pitch, um, which is interesting. But I think, I don't know. I, like I said, I really like LinkedIn, but more so I'm, I'm kind of long on, on YouTube. Are you creating for YouTube yet? No, no, but with stuff like this, that, that's again, that's part of the plan too, right? So building up that podcast muscle, and I think it translates well to YouTube, um, create some awareness. I think that that's that's definitely part of what I want to do this year. Um, I took a bit of a pause overall with business this year. We we had our third child, my wife and I. Congratulations, so, man! Thank you. Yeah, so things boy got hectic. Boy, I got two two beautiful girls, and then finally I got my boy as number three. I was gonna say you got your boy, Adam boy. <laughs> So that's why uh, probably what September, October, I really just slowed down overall because, as you know, it's hard to turn off when you're social selling, when you're, you know, your business uh, relies heavily on social media. It becomes challenging to turn off, but at times you need to. Um, so that's why going into next year, a lot of things are going to ramp up uh, across different platforms. But yeah, it, it, YouTube, I think, is, you know, for guys like you, man, and, and the, the way you create content and, and your videos. I'm not surprised that, that that's your go-to because it, I think you do awesome there. And, um, it, you know, for me, I think what YouTube does really well is, is people, again, they go there for one reason to watch videos. Mm -hmm. They go there to learn that that's probably the number one place people go to learn shit. Instagram, they want to go and they, sometimes they want to feel good. And yeah, maybe they want to learn sometimes, but if I'm going on YouTube, I'm, I have a question that I want answered or I need to do something or learn something. And that's where I'm going to go to find a video. So I think, I think it's a great platform for that. That's also why like it's my, I'm going long on it. Cause Instagram, it's so much competition and it's because you're competing for attention. Yeah. I'm not saying that YouTube isn't that way, but it, you're competing against like as a business owner or as a coach, you're competing not against other brand specialists, not against other salespeople. You're, you're competing against the person shaking their ass to the latest trend. Right. <laughs> Versus on YouTube, it's middle of the funnel because you're searching for it. Like I to your like I want to learn this thing, and so when I, I had this like kind of aha moment, I've been creating for YouTube for a bit now, like maybe six months, seven months, something like that. And it's a slow build, and I'm like, why are once I got into it, I was like, man, this shit's like the capabilities of YouTube are crazy. Like it's owned by Google, so obviously there's search after like it's oh great, why are people doing it? And then I go, oh, because it's a long term play. Like, again, I've been, I said I've been creating content for six months. I don't have any viral videos. Like, the yeah. most, like, the biggest views I got on one of my posts is like 100, 200 views. Like, that's it. And so, we don't, there's not this um, immediate gratification that we maybe have on Instagram. Like, I have 100, I've been creating for six months. Uh, I have 149 subscribers. Like, that's nothing. But, it, and then I go, oh, but I also am recognizing, though, that because the way that I use YouTube, you know, it, I think is interesting in that I don't do it to get a bunch of subscribers or even to make money. I use it to as a supplement. So, like, for example, and you tell me if you think this is a good sales strategy. But one of the things, like, uh, we, we have a closer right now that basically when they get on a call and let's say they have, they're like, hey, I have this problem. Well, we don't try to close you on the first call. We'll go, you know what? Actually, I think we have a free training on YouTube. I'll send it to you. And so we use it as a, as a free gift. Like yeah. I create this for, Hey, here's a thing I made for you. I get hope it helps you. Now the game plan though is on the long run. If I can, in, to me, sales is about time and trust, right? Well, it's about trust obviously, but if I can increase the amount of time you spend with me, then trust goes up. So instead of just saying, Hey, I'm going to build trust with you. I'm going to go, I'm going to have you spend more time with me because the more time you spend with me, and this is why YouTube is good because again, it's long form then you're going to find out if you trust me or not like pretty fast, right? And I would imagine if I get you to spend two hours a week watching just my content, you're going to decide faster, right, if you're, if you're going to uh, buy from me. Is, that's the theory anyway. I know you can tell me if I'm full of shit or not, but I, I think that's the right theory. <laughs> oh, I, you're on to something, man, because what, what I've found works best and I'd recommend to anybody is you should always be offering something. You should never be asking for something. And this is, I'm talking about a prospect, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if, if I'm trying to, ultimately I'm trying to sell you on something, right? Like, Hey, Raylan, you and I were talking today, not to become best buddies, 
But if I'm if I'm trying to sell to you, it, I have obviously a plan, right? So I want to offer you what I can, and that's that's knowledge, guidance, a fresh perspective, right? And there's a number of ways you can do that, but you sending over relevant video clips and, and you know, links to your podcast and, and things like that, you're offering them free knowledge, free advice. And so at, at that point, it's more effective for you to, again, to build that relationship as opposed to you saying, hey, you know, let's meet in person one time. Let me, let me walk you through my program, my products, right? You can get to that, but part of any sales strategy, right, that's more focused on outbound is you need to be offering them something that they're actually going to find valuable. And, and if you're just asking for time, um, you know, a lot of guys talk about that being a high friction ask. If I'm, if, if I'm asking you for your time, that there's going to be a lot of friction behind that because maybe I don't have time. Maybe I don't have any interest in talking to you anymore. But if I'm just offering you something and I think based on my knowledge that it's going to be somewhat relevant, then I think it should resonate more than if I'm, you know, blasting you with, with emails and shit asking for 15 minutes, right? I think there's a lot more you can do with that type of content than trying to requisition people's time. Is there any um, lead generation or sales strategies that you're really big on right now that, that work for you that you would recommend other people? Like one of the things I think, I think I mentioned this before, but I think one of my favorite things about this podcast is asking, just seeing how many different coaches, consultants do it differently. And everyone has their own way of doing it. And so it's kind of fascinating to me. So do you have like a strategy that you use, whether it's on Instagram or wherever to get clients that you like? So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, there's no black and white sales. I've been in so many fucking sales courses and trainings where they think they have a silver bullet. It doesn't exist. Uh, but what is consistent is how, again, depending on what you're selling, but I would say services, if, if you're a service provider, educating people on why they actually need a coach or whatever, right, is important because everyone says, I can probably do this on my own, mm -hmm. but we have to educate them on why and so what your value is, but also things that they haven't even thought of yet. Like, oh, hey, you know, it's great that you have a vision, but you're going to hit all of these roadblocks along the way and you're not really going to know how to pivot and get past them. And that's the value of a coach, right? Like, like any athlete in the world would tell you that they have a coach and this coach is beneficial, even though that the athlete might be way more skilled than them, right? The coach just can still add some value there. So my strategy has really been on educate, educating the audience on, on those, I guess, objections that come up right off the bat. And, and again, most of it is I can do it myself or, um, you know, I, I'm just not ready for this. So you have to kind of knock down those barriers ahead of time. And that's where your content strategy becomes most important. I, I don't really focus much on the inspirational. I think it has a place, but for me, it's it's knowledge sharing, education, um, and and a little bit of the personal side of it. But I I really want people to to be crystal clear on how I can help them and why they should care about what I can do for them. Because a lot of people they just you know they they default back to the I, I just don't really understand what this guy can do for me. Yeah. Um, is there, do you feel like what percentage right now do you feel like is like inbound versus outbound? Like how much are you reaching out to people to see if they want to jump on a call with you versus them saying, Hey, I want to jump on a call with you. I don't, I don't really do any outbound for sales. Nice. Um, I do networking, right? So I'll see a guy like you on, on Instagram, be like, Hey man, like let's chat kind of like what, you know, how you and I got introduced. Right. Um, so that, that I find it. And Yes, that's part of a sales strategy because we're creating content together, which, and there's always, there's, you know, there's some intent behind that. But in terms of going after prospects and, and people that I think would be a fit, I, I just spend my resources and my time on trying to attract them to me versus me trying to go out and pull them in because I just, I just don't find it has the same impact. And over time, I mean, most good outbound strategies are, are, what successful 10% of the time, 20% of the time. I just if think that there's better ways you can spend resources, right? <clears throat> yeah. If that, and the, the reason if I asked too, is because I think there's a lot of people that have, I, I think people misunderstand the attraction marketing kind of play similar to what you're doing and that they think it's going to happen overnight and they're going to have a fuck ton of leads tomorrow yeah. when it's like, that's a long term play. Like, and I think people that are listening need to understand that. Cause again, 
you know, there's so many people, you know, I hate to say the word gurus and shit like that, but like there's people that have this idea that like once I start creating content, I'm going to have a bunch of people reach out to me and want to work with me. It doesn't yeah. work like that. <laughs> like it's going to yeah. take time. And it's also like doing what you're doing, which it's an outbound strategy, but it's like, it's that networking. Hey, I love your shit. Da da da. Like, and then it's also about like having a community of people that you engage on their stuff. They engage on yours, which means their audience sees their stuff. And there's a lot of that go that goes on. But again, all of that takes time. And I don't think people are honest about that. Like, no, no. And, and you know what? Um, that's, that's a clear indicator of, of they're not here for the right reasons. And, and we're all here financially. Yeah. Okay. But I'm talking about like, are they truly aligning to a passion and, and are they, have they really found something that, that is going to sustain their interest long term? Because if, if, you know, if, if you try something and you fail or sorry, I shouldn't say fail. Cause I don't believe that's, that's what this is. If you try something, it doesn't work right away and you just totally you know, deviate from it or you just stop doing it entirely you haven't given it time to, to, to really kind of, you know, find its way. And, and also clearly you weren't really dedicated to it. Um, because anybody who's created a business, man, you, you know, it, sometimes it takes one, two, three attempts to find out what, what actually is going to become, uh, financially viable and posting content is, is a part of, of a broader strategy, but yeah, totally. No one is going to come to you and say, Hey man, um, I saw that post you made, let's work together right away. It's, it's usually there's more to it than that. It helps bring people to you, right? Um, and that will be what I would say would be the inbound piece. And then, it's, it's, then the sales process starts, okay? And then, then I begin to learn about them, and, and then I begin to pique their curiosity. And then we really kind of mutually agree on something that would, would um, hit all of the different things they want to do, right? Check every box in terms of, of what their vision is for their business. So I think that... It is, it's always going to be a long-term play, and, and you got to look at the first 12 months as, as a growing period. Um, you might have things that you think are going to be really, uh, you know, content that's going to really play well, and it doesn't, and you're not sure why. But having that network, like you talked about, right, of, of people around it that are going to support you, um, and sharing your own stories back and forth, that's kind of what you need when, when things aren't growing as fast as you'd like. Yeah. Is it? Is, do, are you currently a part of any, like – masterminds or did you create one like what let's start there like did you when you first started did you hire a coach like what did you do to get started and to figure out what you wanted to do no i mean not a, not a coach in a traditional sense like i've had mentors throughout my entire career and i find that so valuable people that have just been through it right if if they haven't been through it how can they really coach you on it that's something that i always kind of think um so, so no, I, I didn't go out and hire a, a, you know, a coach and a one-to-one -one program. I, I had, like I said, so I've been through so many sales courses in my career and, you know, branding and, and now with the mentors that have helped me kind of well round my knowledge. Um, I fell into coaching by posting content and people then reaching out and saying, Hey, like, how can we work together? I love this. This is awesome. So I, I didn't attend any masterminds. I, I, I have um, more in a supporting role for, for, you know, peers and stuff like that. But it's not something that I've, that I've spent a lot of time doing in, in the last 12 months. So I, I took a lot of the knowledge that I learned through other courses and other stuff and have now tried to create my own unique package, which is, is pretty much one-on-one -on -one coaching. It's, it's very, you know, kind of custom tailored packages. And then as, as the, the business scales a little bit, I could see being more of a one to many, but certainly right now it's, it's focused on, you know, more of a deep intensive coaching workshop. Well, like I, I try to explain this to someone recently, but like, so for you, for example, right. When there are people that I hear that didn't hire a coach and then they're trying to be coaches and I'm like, it's going to be really difficult to figure it out because there's a bit of a um, learning curve. But the thing that people yeah. don't get is when you come from sales and you come from corporate sales, you that's the best way to become the skill set of being a coach comes from that because yeah. as you know right like with your teams you have to when you start off in sales you're having you know maybe a daily stitch meeting every single day you're being coached on you know you're being listened to like you're being yeah. coached a lot and then when you become a manager like i had a team of 120 that i was listening to all their calls we were having you know weekly meetings and and so like i before i became a coach had already been coaching the amount of hours I've been a coach was far greater than most people. And so the same goes for you, right? Like you came from a sales background. So that's where to me, you're more qualified to be a fucking coach 
than most of the coaches out here because like they've never actually. And I think the word coach is so interesting because people throw it around now because everyone's a coach these days. Yeah. I know. But the question is, you can maybe get a win, but can you get somebody else a win? And like you know, when I went from salesperson to sales manager, that was like that hardest transition where it was like, I don't get why you idiots can't do it like I did it. And so you had to like figure out like, okay, how can I get you to the same you know outcome as I did? And so again, like it's funny because it's like, yes, you didn't hire a coach when we got first started, but again, bro, you the amount of hours that you put into coaching before you even became a coach is ridiculous. And yeah, and actually, it's I'm glad you said that because. I, I usually position myself more as a consultant. Um, and that's why my Instagram name is, is the brand consultant, which I'm debating changing. But anyways, it, what um, is the difference so to you? Like, what is the in, difference? In my opinion, coach is, it's more personal, right? It's, it's, so if, if I'm like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to, this person's going to hire me to be their coach. I'm going to get really deep in understanding the personal side of it. Whereas with consulting, you know, we're moving towards an objective and consulting would, would probably be more relevant to businesses. So if, if in more of a B2B fashion, um, and there's obviously there's individual consultants as well, but in, in my world, I find consultant is a word or, or, you know, a category that plays better for businesses and business owners. Um, because for them, it's, it's, it seems to be an easier decision to hire a consultant versus hiring a personal coach. But if it's someone that, that doesn't have a business yet and they're, and they're just looking, they want to learn a lot more than just about sales. They need to learn about fucking branding, business, finances, all this shit together. I find a coach who just has more of a broader net they can cast around people. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to go back to what you were talking about, about being in sales, right? Like you think that you are slick on the phone or in a meeting. Try having your leadership team listen to every call you make, right? Try having guys that have been in your seat for 10 years listening in on every word you use, every question you ask, every response you have, that builds up a skill and some muscle, right? And, and you, you get comfortable with failure and you understand, you, you know, what's going to come next in a lot of these conversations, uh, you know, how to overcome objections, how to really get clear in your message because you don't want to sound like an idiot. I think a lot of that stuff comes from corporate sales and, and there's a lot of really good programs. I've got to work with so many guys that have kind of branched off and formed their own coaching programs which really is the skills they learned when they were in their seat at part of a corporate sales gig, right? So that's a lot of that transforms, transports really well to one to one coaching because, you know, the same stuff that, that people are going to throw at you, I don't have the budget for it, this isn't the right time, I'm not ready, all that shit. I mean, we hear that 50 times a day in corporate sales. So you understand how to talk through it. And the most effective people that do it are the ones that, that you know, they, they're not trying necessarily to overcome the objection. They, they're empathizing with the person and wanting, they're curious about where this is coming from. Because it, it's not the first objection you hear isn't the end goal. It, an end all. There's usually a lot more to it that you want to kind of suss out, right? So yeah. that's where the coaching side just naturally came to be. So I got, I got two more questions. Uh, yeah. So one is, is what problems are you kind of working through right now to try to figure out to solve? Uh, and again, the reason I ask this is because, again, what I don't like about a lot of coaching podcasts and, and you know, whatever is that, again, we try to put online that we got everything fucking figured out when we don't. And yeah. so what I like to do is like, especially on these, I had somebody recently that already is, you know, he's a seven figure, you know, consultant. And, and like, he immediately was like, Oh, this is the problem. Like, I don't know how to solve this. Like, I'm, so my point I'm trying to make is like, when people are listening to this is that like you, I have found that people that struggle as coaches and consultants don't know their fucking problems. And it's, it's mind blowing to me. Like, you don't know like your biggest block. Like, I think it was last week that I was talking about this on the podcast, but like my biggest block that I had to figure out, uh, most recently was how to step into a leadership role, which is fascinating to me because I was in a leadership role in corporate. Well, I went from solopreneur to having a team of six to now I have to move into being a CEO, which mm -hmm. is very different because a lot of, especially with the agency, I'm not doing a lot of the work, but it yeah. has to still, so I had to get back into Mike, which is, again, it's interesting, at least to me anyway, how to run a meeting. I forgot how to run a fucking meeting. You know what I mean? And also how to taper my vision because sometimes I'm fucking crazy. 
I'm crazy a lot. And then I'll have a, I'll say, Hey, this is the project we're going to be working on. This is the new launch, whatever. Two days later, I'm like, I got a brand new plan. All right. Brand new thing. We're going to do this now. And then I'm, and then I get mad at my team. Cause I'm like, why is nothing fucking happening? <laughs> well, cause I'm an, I'm keep throwing more shit. Anyway, my point is, what do you, what do you, what problem are you working through right now in your, in your business? I think it's, you know, and a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with the same thing, right? It's how do you stay aligned to your vision when all kinds of other, you know, mundane tasks are eating at your time, right? You know what's important to the growth of your business, what's going to make an impact to the revenue, but how do you manage, and, and I guess it's, you know, I hate to use time management because it's such a fucking boring topic, but yeah. um, really, you know, how, how do you keep your business moving towards that vision, but not missing steps that are also going to be important? So like, this is not necessarily solely about sales and branding, um, but you need to, to know, okay, you know, how am I going to create content, make connections? How am I going to build up my program and my courses and my offers? And all these different things. So I, I'm working through, uh, you know, how to become more efficient, I think, in what I'm doing. And a lot of that is is better using technology, uh, you know, not trying to recreate everything from scratch, right? So that, that's something that I, I have noticed that if, if I'm going to continue to move in this direction, I need to just get way more efficient with, with you know, content and shit like this because I, I can't. I can't keep spending an hour on a post. It's got to be quick and more effective. And ultimately, I got to give more of my time to my clients than my business. But I need to keep the business moving in the right direction, too. So it's just kind of balanced. It's a balancing act. The young one, man, like the you you got a new baby now. Like, dude, (laughs) efficiency is like even more important now. That's right. And you got to work at at hours you don't typically work at, right? 5 a.m., 9 p.m. That's when you got to get your shit done. But I guess how I'm working through it is I'm just not negotiating with myself. I I'm going to do something and that's going to be the end of it. I'm not going to try and get out of it and weasel my way into the next day. And no, I'm going to do it. Um, and it, it's going to get done one way or the other. And that's the only way you can continue to move forward is just get your shit done. <laughs> uh, is which, there like, know. I feel like, um, again, this is just a recommendation, but one of the things that I, especially when I first started, um, getting somebody, I think Car- what, which of the content do you think takes the longest? So for me, it was carousel because I hate writing. Yeah. But I think I'm trying to remember the first thing that I offloaded was writing. So I found somebody on Instagram. No, yeah, I did. I found somebody on Instagram. And what I did was I basically had them um, take my reels or I would just send voice notes. Yeah. And they would turn it into carousels for me. And like they, he could not because like, I, you know, for me, I'm not a writer. I don't know about you. I'm more of a talker than a writer. So I think that was the first thing I did. And I can't remember how much I was spending. I was spending like 200 bucks a month. Like if that, um, but it was saving me so much damn time, dude. Yeah. Oh, and it's true, man. Like, you know, know what to outsource, right? Like you said, know what you're not great at. You understand that. And then, and yeah, outsourcing, it makes a lot of sense. Like I'm, you know, carousels take time and that's kind of why I don't post quite as many as I used to. It's, it's, you know, it takes a minute for me to create a video and share it. That, that's nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've, I've made more of that content lately than the carousels, but yeah, eventually um, you have to outsource something. You can't just keep everything under wraps and micromanage the shit out of everything, right? Yeah. All right. Last question. What's your vision? So, in the next like five years, what will this? What will your company turn into? <laughs> One of my favorite. The reason I asked this is because um, there's a guy. There's a book called Vivid Vision by Cameron Harold, and uh, I'm actually having to redo this. But um, he talks about writing a vivid vision, basically a word. It's almost like a um, what's those stupid pictures called? A uh, vision board. It's almost like a vision board yeah. with words. And he says that like a vision board, the problem with a vision board is they're picture based and a picture says a thousand words or the word says what it means. And so anyway, um, he had this really cool sales strategy, bro. Like it's so interesting to me, but it basically, he was like, he wrote out the vivid vision for his company. Uh, he used to, he used to be the COO of 1-800-JUNK. Mm-hmm. And uh, so anyway, what they did was they wrote the vivid vision, what the company's going to be in like five years and they put it on the website. So what was fascinating was people came and worked with them, not because of who they were today, but because of who they were going to be in five years. Isn't that yeah. interesting? Anyway, so what's your what's your vision? Like, what what are you what are you creating? So uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm big on on keeping very, you know, unique content, right? And and I I want what I have in my mind, all these different thoughts about different programs, and and what I have in my coaching program today. I want it to be consumable on demand. So whether that that's more you know, online learning type of stuff. Um, 
in-person workshops and seminars and, and all these different things. Like, you know, I don't know if you follow Chris Dew on Instagram, right? Um, but you see what he's doing and, and how you're in some of these workshops in front of people and the conversation is just, it's just flowing naturally. And it's so exciting to, to be that. So I want to get to a point where I've elevated myself as, as the authority when it comes to, you know, sales and branding and personal branding and, and leadership and, and stuff like that to where my content becomes so digestible for the masses and where I'm now, you know, kind of out still doing my thing about talking about this stuff. Um, but it's not going to be in a one-to-one fashion for everybody. I'm going to be more selective with that and, and focus on, on trying to create as many entrepreneurs as I can, um, you know, because that's kind of what I like doing. Um, by the way, we just had, I don't know if you uh, know this, but we just had our first live workshop uh, November, last month. Yeah. And so much fun. Like, there's a lot. And, and when you get best, to the point man. where you're, when you're about to do your first workshop, like you and I will talk and I'll tell you what all the f- mistakes I fucking made, which was a lot. Um, but still, dude, it was just because like with the elevated. So uh, with elevated, for example, like the mastermind, I've never met everybody in person. So it was the first time one like current Academy members got together and uh, we had like my video editor flow in from UK to come. Tim, who we mentioned earlier, like Tim I've, and, and I have known each other and worked together for the last like two years. I've never met him before in person. So that alone was worth fucking everything, dude. But yeah. it was it was tons of fun, and we got tons of content from it. Like, it's so worth it. So anyway, um, brother, I appreciate you for for coming on the call uh, call the podcast. Um, this was tons of fun. I, le- I learned a lot, obviously, of you. And, and listen, man, I think what you're doing is unique in and of itself. You have a different style of the way that you do it, and uh, I know you're gonna help a lot of people. So I appreciate you you joining on the show, man. Likewise, man. This has been good. I, I love talking about this stuff, and hopefully it's the first of many. Uh, your stuff's awesome, too. Keep going. I love the no-nonsense and no-bullshit when it comes to coaches, right? And we need more of that. Keep I it up. I appreciate that, man. All right, dude. Uh, I'll see you soon. Thanks, y'all, for listening. <laughs>